thank you for coming along. Um, my name's Neil Thompson. I used to work for Sony for a long time, but I'm kind of over it now and in a full recovery procedure. Um, and I'm now part of one of their, their pool of independent experts, they call them. It's more of a puddle than a pool, really, but I, I'm, I'm one of them anyway. And uh, I'm here to talk to you about uh, full-frame technology and uh, the Sony FX9 and the Sony Venice, um, which are all the rage at the moment. Full-frame technology, everybody's doing full-frame at the moment. It seems to be um, the next big thing. And in an industry full of next big things, I know we're always seeing another next big thing coming along very shortly. But um, I think this one's here to stay. This is... Um, this is not 3D. You don't have to wear weird glasses and feel ill sitting on the sofa to watch this. Um, this is something that's going to be here to stay for some time. And there's lots of camera manufacturers making full frame technology. So I thought I'd have a look at this technology and see exactly what it, what it does for us and, and why we need it or why we don't need it. And if we do need it, what we can do with it and so on. So um, everybody's making a camera these days. Um, Everybody in the world, I imagine several of you will be off back to your garages and your workshops after this show uh, and busily 3D printing a new camera, full frame obviously, in your uh, workshop. But I thought I'd have a quick look at the technology that goes into these things and, and what exactly full frame is and, uh, and what it isn't and what it's going to do for you. So when we're designing a camera, we have to choose an image sensor size to go in the front of the camera body itself. And the image sensor is, is the heart and soul of the camera, really. It, it's what makes it tick. And if you haven't got a decent image sensor at the front end, then you can pack up and go home, really. I have to say that Sony, it, it says, I'm getting a message coming in on the ship from the back of my head, coming in from Tokyo, that says that Sony makes some pretty good image sensors. They're, it's what they do, really. And the image sensing division, particularly in the Sony Corporation, is uh, going like a train at the moment. Uh, making sensors for all sorts of cameras, for all sorts of um, uh, different applications. But when you're designing a camera, you have to choose the size of that image sensor that goes up at the front end. So how big should it be? And how do you make that decision? Well, you've got a number of interlocking factors to take into account. You've got the physics of the world to take into account. And the, the, the physics of the world tell you that... Um, the, the, there are certain sensitivity benefits in making a larger camera. You can gather more light, if you like. Uh, by putting a larger sensor up at the front, you'll naturally get a, a shallower depth of field for your camera, which might be a good thing, and usually is a good thing, but could be a bad thing. Um, you've got other factors as well, like display technology. And if you're making a, a, a sensor, it has to be a particular shape. I suppose it could be a round sensor that would be to look a bit weird, but not many people make round televisions at the moment. It can't be long before they start doing so, but uh, at the moment there aren't many. So you've got to think a bit about whether you, you, you're having a 16 by 9 display technology that you're aiming for, or a 4 by 3 even, or a 5 by 4 I, w I wasn't aware until recently how many people are shooting in formats other than 16 by 9 me being a, from a bit of a, a boring engineering background, I was always uh, pretty convinced that 16 by 9 was the only format, really, in aspect ratio. But of course, we've got 17 by 9. We've got 5 by 4 and 4 by 5, all this Instagram business that someone as old and crusty as me doesn't properly understand. But uh, a friend of mine who works in, in, uh, as a production company was saying that really in the last two years, he's rarely shot anything in 16 by 9 at all. It's all been destined for other aspect ratios. So you have to think a little bit about what kind of shape that image sensor should, it, should be. Should it be 16 by 9 or 9 by 16 for all the portrait work that you're going to be doing? So that's another factor to take into account. And um, you've also got to think about the manufacturing difficulties. In the olden days, when, when uh, I came into the industry, it was all CCD technology, which was the, the semiconductor sandwich that made up the image sensor at the front end. And CCD technology was a bit limited, and you couldn't physically make it very big. Two-thirds inch sort of size was about the maximum you could get away with. Nowadays, with CMOS technology and different manufacturing techniques, it's quite easy to make a big chunk of silicon and make a great big image sensor. You can stick lots of pixels on it and call it your, your new 96 megapixel uh, sensor or whatever. But is that a good idea? 
how, how, what is the optimum size for, for building your uh, sensing technology at the front end? If you build it too big, you end up with too many pixels that need to be read out every frame, and you end up incurring costs in terms of heat and power consumption and so on. So there's nothing free in this life. And a lot of it is about kind of getting a balance right. Um, Sony used to have um, some um, polo shirts that they used to give us with one of those corporate marketing phrases on that said, choice without compromise. Which when you think about it actually means absolute bollocks really, to be honest. That there is no choice without compromise. Choice is a matter of finding the best compromise really. And um, what we're looking at here is balancing all these things like the physics, the display technology that you're aiming for, uh, the manufacturing and the lens design as well. And uh, balancing all these to get the, the best optimum performance out of your camera. Now, um, that is, um, that's all very well, but what we've ended up with is something called full frame technology. And I just wanted to take a step backwards and find out where full frame came from and uh, what it actually means. If we go back to the days of uh, film technology, and a 35 millimeter film. Your, uh, your film strip was 35 millimeters wide, logically enough, which meant that inside that area, you could fit an image that was about 24 millimeters high. The maximum size image you could squeeze into that bit of good old fashioned celluloid. And if you wanted a sensible three by two sort of aspect ratio, that would be about 36 millimeters wide. And that's where we, we, we start from with our full frame technology. It's not really a technology that has until recently been of any relevance to the moving picture industry. The moving picture industry has done things a little bit differently. But if you wanted to make a stills camera and then move it into the digital environment, then you might as well start with a sensor size that was exactly the same size as the um, chunk of celluloid that you've been using in your stills camera. That kind of makes sense because all the lenses that you've been using in the stills world, you could just chuck them straight onto the front of your brand new DSLR or, or digital stills camera and everything would be fine and wonderful. So that all kind of makes sense and until we, we step into the moving pictures world where the film goes through the camera in the other direction. We're pulling the camera, pulling the camera, pulling the film through the camera in a, in a vertical direction. And that makes things a little bit different because our horizontal width can now only be 24 millimeters rather than 36, 36 millimeters. So it ends up a little bit different. And in the moving pictures world, we've typically thought of, well, we've never really had something called full frame. There's been any number of gate sizes and frame sizes and aspect ratios, far too many to, to, to go into. And uh, uh, there's a whole book worth of that. Typically, we will be talking about, uh, as, a, as a reference point, super 35 millimeter, three per film, three perforations per frame, 35 millimeters across, and the traditional sort of moving image uh, film format. And that would be ab about um, 25 by 14 millimeters, which is somewhat less. And that was what we would call super 35. And cameras like the the Sony FS, FS7, uh, the Canon C300, the Arri Alexa, the Sony F5, F55. There's a whole suite of cameras that use that kind of image sensor size. But nothing really uh, until, um, actually our, our good friends at Canon were probably the first people to move a stills camera into the moving picture uh, environment with the 5D Mark II. But since then, many people have started using full frame technology in a moving pictures world. But as you can see, it, it's physically quite big compared to Super 35 mil, and certainly compared to two thirds inch formats, which um, for me from a traditional broadcast engineering background is, is where you would start from. So it, it's a big change. So what differences to our lives is that change gonna make? One of the main differences, I guess, is the lens coverage that we're, we're gonna need. If you're going to stick a big image sensor in the front, the lens has to project an image onto the back of the camera that will cover that entire image sensor area. 
and if you've got a big sensor, you're going to need a big piece of glass up at the front. And the first 4K cameras that came out were all super 35 mil size. You needed a fairly big chunk of area in order to fit all the, squeeze all the pixels onto it in order to go 4K. So the first 4K cameras were all super 35, but therefore needed extra large lens technology in order to, to fit on the front of there if, if it was going to work properly. Um, I don't know if any of you remember back as far as the, the, the Rio World Cup in Brazil. Uh, anybody? It was um, a pretty big event for Sony in particular because Sony put their hand up and said, oh, we'll do it in 4K, no problem at all. Except it was a bit of a problem really because getting the lens technology to cover a, a giant football stadium is, um, is all very well with a two-thirds inch sensor, which is what we've traditionally been using. And of course, we still use in most live sports and OB sort of production today. But finding lens, lenses that would cover a Super 35 image sensor size and at the same time give you a massive zoom range for working a, in a football stadium with a 106 times zoom or something, it just doesn't work. You build a 106 times zoom that covers a Super 35 image sensor, it'd be about the size of a, a Mercedes Sprinter van and about 11 times the price. So it just really would not work. So they had to do some clever um, lens adapters in order to expand the image out in order to fill the full Super 35 image sensor. So. It's all very well moving to a larger sensor, but there's usually a bit of a downside to it. So you just need to be a little bit careful. I'm not selling all this full frame camera technology very well here, am I, so far? It's, it's, uh, I also point out that it's really great, but at the same time, it is worth noting that you will have to think carefully about lens coverage technology. If you're gonna put a big sensor up there, you're gonna need a big piece of glass in order to cover it. And I guess many of you who've used cameras like the FS7 and, and, and cameras of that ilk have been looking for a, a lens, one lens that you can shoot with all day long and will cover your wides through to your tight angle shots with a rocker switch goes zzz, zzz, and it'll, it'll just, just do it. And you won't have to think about swapping lenses. Has anybody found one yet? Anybody? Anybody? No. Well, I've got some bad news for you because when you move to full frame technology, it's going to get even more difficult. So please bear that in mind there. There will be no one lens that's going to do everything for you. There's some lenses that try. I mean, the, the lens on the FX9 that is, is just on the corner of the Sony stand there is, the, is a kit lens, is a 28 to 135 mil lens. Uh, and that's okay. It's, it's, it's okay. It's, but it's, it's, no, it's no HJ21 times zoom or something like that, really, that... Um, uh, the old school amongst us might have been used to. So in the Super 35 world, we've got F5s, F55s, FS5s, and so on. Um, it's all moved on now, and full frame is the new big thing on the, on the block. And started with cameras like the A7, A9 series, stills cameras, but then moved into the moving pictures cameras with Venice and uh, the new FX9, which is um, very popular just at the moment. So these all fundamentally use the same size sensor, 36 mil by 24, same size as, as you would have found on your DSLRs, as I mentioned before. So what does putting a large sensor on the, on the front of the camera do for us? Well, it gives us more area, so we've got more room to stick our pixels on. So the, the, the assembly line people in Japan who sit on the end of the production line sticking all the pixels on will have to spend a little more time with the full frame cameras because they've got a lot more space to fill up with their pixels. Uh, alternatively, you could just use bigger pixels uh, and, and save yourself some bother. And we'll, th there is an argument that by using bigger pixels, you can increase the sensitivity of your camera, which is kind of true, but ain't necessarily so, as we'll see in a minute. Uh, what else could you do with your excess area? Um, you could, uh, obviously, you'll, you're, you're going to change the wide angle performance of your lenses. So for a given focal length, on a full frame camera, you'll get a wider angle of view than you will with a Super 35 camera. For a lens of a particular focal length, but the assumption there, of course, is that the coverage of that lens is sufficient to cover the extra area involved. So that, that is something that you would need to take into account. Um, there's a word here that I have a little bit of difficulty with, bokeh. 
or bokeh or I'm never quite sure exactly what it means, to be honest. It's one of those words that kind of sneaked up into my engineering-based world and caught me by surprise. To me, an image is either in focus or out of focus, and it has a depth of field, and it's, it's either out of focus or in focus. But how it goes out of focus um, could be affected by going to full frame. Not really so much by the actual full frame image sensor size itself, but perhaps more by the, the different types of lenses that you might be using in a full frame environment that might give you a different bokeh or a different, different aesthetic effect when the image goes out of focus. One effect that you will notice though that is, is very similar it will be of course that you will get a shallower depth of field. It's not strictly speaking true that changing the image format size will give you a shallower depth of field. Uh, if you want to maintain the same angle of view uh, by, and change the image format size, then yes, it will, but for a reason, again, I'll come on to a little bit later. But certainly, shallower depth of field is something that goes with the large format. So for those of you shooting sport, uh, you, can, you can leave now, really, because you're not really going to be interested in full frame. You want to just get it in focus and the punters at home watching the sky football are not desperately interested in a creative focus pull between a striker and a winger sort of thing. It's, it's not really what they're there for. So for that particular application, your two 13-inch cameras are going to be around for some time yet. They're not going to go away anytime soon. But if you want to get creative with your image technology, then there is no better way really to do so than to put a full frame image sensor at the front end of the camera. It gives you that shallow depth of field that you may or may not have been looking for, whether you like it or not. Um, and as I mentioned before, you, you, you're going to get less reach out of your lenses with the, the full frame camera. So if you make your image sensor larger, um, you can embiggen your pixels in, in order to fill that area. Embiggen is a Simpsons word, by the way, if none of you have come across it before. So you can embiggen your pixels and stay exactly the same resolution as you were before, but just have a larger um, uh, uh, individual pixel sizes. And there is an argument that by doing so, you can increase the dynamic range and you can increase the sensitivity of your camera by being able to have bigger pixels that capture more light. It's not, strictly speaking, in itself true, but it is kind of true in, it, in, in, in its after effects sort of way. The other thing you can do, which cameras like the FX9 and the Venice camera do, this is the way they work, is you, you keep a central area of the image sensor that might, for instance, be sort of super 35 mil size, exactly the same as it was before, and then just add on extra pixels to fill up the extra area that's available. And if you do that cleverly, you can end up with, for instance, a 6K image sensor that you can switch back to a super 35 mil cutout mode and we'll still have 4K sampling across the image sensor in super 35 mode and, and have like a sort of super 35 cutout mode, which is exactly the same as like an FS7 or a, an F55 camera in terms of its resolution. And that, if you can manage that, that, that works really well. So, which is better? embiggening or additionalizing. Additionalizing is a word I made up. I'm afraid that's not, that's, uh, not a real one, I don't think. Um, if you add more pixels on there, two benefits you get. One is that you can increase the resolution of the image sensor. Obviously, if you put more sensor photo sites on the front end, you're going to increase the, the, the resolution. The other thing that you can do with it is it, you can choose to chop out different aspect ratios. You can think of the full frame sensor, not just as full frame, but as an area of real estate that you can use to chop out different aspect ratios and areas for different projects and different kinds of um, uh, projects and work, which is a, a different way of looking at it. Um, but it relies on, on the camera manufacturing uh, manufacturer allowing you to do that. So if we look at sensitivity, if you just make your pixels bigger, there is an argument that you capture more light. Not strictly speaking true, because if you think of the, 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 the total amount of light coming in through the lens, whether your image sensor looks like that 
or it looks like that, you're still capturing all those photons, all those electromagnetic particles are still being captured and converted into electrical charge, we hope. So the sensitivity of the camera doesn't actually change if you stick with the small size sensor, um, image sensor uh, photo sites. What does make the difference is all the, the plumbing that goes around the edges of those photo sites. And unfortunately what happens is that when you um, make the uh, photo site smaller, uh, that the pipe work that goes around the edges of them doesn't shrink in exactly the same ratio. And what happens is that quite a lot of the photons all get caught in the pipes and, and discarded and wasted. So although changing the size of your pixels will affect your sensitivity, it's maybe not directly for the reason you might think there. But it does make a difference. Um, what has happened with the, the new generation of full frame sensors is that the sensor technology has moved on as well. And one of the new technologies that's come along with the, the new full frame sensors in the Venice and the FX9 is this dual ISO mode, where the camera has two base sensitivities. And this is like, it's like free game, which again, to me, from an engineering background, that's not allowed. There's no gain without pain you turn up the electronic amplification of the signal to see in the dark, that's fine. But you expect to pay the price by seeing the noise in the camera all sort of rise up and that graininess and noise that goes with signal amplification is just, as I was always taught, inevitable. But not so, apparently. There's now this magic, black magic, it's not black magic, black magic, it's Sony black magic, which is a bit different. There's this sort of magic way of converting uh, the, uh, the, the base sensitivity of the camera from, for instance, in the, the FX9, it goes from 500 in its normal mode up to 4,000, just at the click of a button. And on the camera just behind you there, there's a assignable button seven is, is allocated to, to be the dual base ISO. You can press the button and hey presto, magic gain you can see in the dark. And it shouldn't work, but it does. And again, credit to another manufacturer here, Panasonic were one of the first people to come out with this sort of technique. It's been refined since by Sony and made much better, obviously. But uh, it's a similar kind of principle and uh, is also available on the Venice camera system as well with the high-end cinema camera, which um, unfortunately we haven't brought with us today by uh, some uh, slight error. So you've got this dual ISO where you can operate the camera at two completely different sensitivities just at the flick of a button. And it gives a, a very, very tiny amount of extra noise into the picture, but at the same time gives you a, a massive amount of flexibility in terms of shooting, not in the dark, I would say, but in shooting low light conditions. So just looking at aspect ratio flexibility, um, if I look at the Venice camera to illustrate this, and um, it's a new image sensor right at the front end, global shutter, um, uh, extraordinary color rendition, a very wide color space and all that. But what I want to look at is how that image sensor is used, the space is, is um, what, what it's used for. And typically from Sony you'll find a diagram like this which is massively complicated and you think what on earth is going on here. Um, but it's trying to illustrate the different aspect ratios and readout modes from our sensor. So as I said before, we have um, a basic image sensor size of 36 mil across by 24 mil high. And into that we pack about 6K pixels by about 4K. Six by four, about three by two aspect ratio. So who's shooting in three by two? No, nobody at all. Of course not, it's a bit weird three by two. But you, you, you don't need to think about what actual shape the sensor is. You need to think about all those different ways that area can be cut out from within that sensor. And the, the most obvious and simple way is to cut out a 4K by 2160, 16 by nine, or the slightly wider version, 17 by nine uh, version there. And that would be your FS7 mode or your F55 mode or your traditional super 35 mil 4K camera mode. And both the Venice and the FX9 have this way of working built into them. It's fundamentally designed into the sensor. 
so that the central core of the image sensor, if you measure out a 28 millimeter diagonal chunk, super 35 mil size, you will find inside that chunk just the right number of pixels for your 4K mode in Super 35. And that kind of makes sense. That's fairly straightforward. Um, there's, a, there's another mode in there which you, you have to pay an additional license for in the Venice camera, um, but it's a four by three chunk out of the camera. And four by three, of course, I've still got a couple of four by three tellies in my garage if, if anyone needs one, but I don't think anybody's using them now. The only reason you would use 4x3 now, really, is for anamorphic mode, which is another next big thing. And I imagine you've all got a, a whole shed full of anamorphic lenses at your disposal. So your 2 to 1 anamorphics would work very well with this 4x3 mode. There's also um, something called a 6x5 mode on the camera as well, uh, which works very well with 2 by one anamorphic squeeze. Uh, I'll just skip ahead, actually, and just explain why those systems work. If you have um, a 4x3 image sensor and you put a 2x1 squeeze lens on it, instead of being 4x3, it ends up being 8x3. And 8 divided by 3 is 2.67 to 1. Sorry, it's getting a bit complicated here. But 2.67 to 1 is a bit wider than you actually need for CinemaScope. CinemaScope would be 2.39 to 1. So you just need to chop a little bit off the edges and you're good to go with your uh, anamorphic CinemaScope production. Hurrah. I imagine most of us are shooting CinemaScope now, surely. Um, alternatively, uh, that's the way uh, traditionally it's been done with electronic cameras. But Sony have introduced a slightly different aspect ratio called 6 to 5. And if you take that 6 and times it by 2 with your 2 to 1 aspect ratio lens, you get 12 by 5. 12 divided by 5 is 2.4 to 1, which is almost exactly CinemaScope. So this new CinemaScope mode is built into the Venice camera as a different way of using your full-frame technology, which is very clever and uh, works really well. But if you don't want to use that, you can do it the traditional way with the 4x3 mode and just put some frame markers up and chop the sides off your CinemaScope uh, uh, in the viewfinder. So just going back to where we were, uh, we've just discovered the wonders of 4x3 and 6x5. But you can also switch the camera to 16x9 um, and 17x9, but using the full frame 6K resolution, which is um, a different way of reading the image sensor out. And what we're starting to see here is, is two different things. How you read the image sensor out and how you record stuff. And these are two different things, which is a bit confusing. If you look in the menus for the project settings of the FX9, it actually comes out for once in Sony menus, pretty straightforward. You choose how you would like to read the sensor, you choose how you would like to record it. So on the FX9, you could read the sensor out at 6K, but you'd record it at 4K, which sounds a bit odd, I know, but I'll come back to that in a minute and explain why it makes sense. Um, Okay, so you can shoot 16x9 and 17x9 in, in uh, full frame. Um, you could also shoot uh, CinemaScope um, 2.39 to 1, straight out the box with a circular lens, uh, without, without any of the, the flare and distortion of, a, of a, uh, an anamorphic lens if you wanted to shoot something CinemaScope. But um, as you can see, there's any number of different modes you can read the sensor out in. Um, going back to the FX9, that's the FX9 doesn't give you quite the same degree of flexibility. It's not designed as a, a cinema camera quite so much as the, the Venice is, so it doesn't have the anamorphic modes. Um, what it does do though is have the exact same way of um, chopping out a 16x9 and 17x9 4K mode for Super 35. So you can chop out your 16x9 mode here at 4K and record that, or you can record the full 6K, um, depending on what the, the project requires. So if you've only got Super 35mm lenses, for instance, that's no barrier to moving into the world of the FX9 camera. 
Um, there's no absolute need, because the FX9 does full-frame recording, to use the full-frame technology. You could continue to use Super 35 lenses if you've got, I don't know, uh, the very nice Fujinon MK series lenses or a, uh, a Canon CN7 or a Fuji Cabriolet or something like that. You could use all these lenses on the, the FX9, just switch it into its Super 35mm mode and the lenses will cover the full sensor size there for you. If you want to move into the full frame world, by all means do so. Put your brand new shiny full frame lens on the front and uh, press the button and away you go. Next bit I want to look at is lenses. And um, there's lots of different lenses available out there. I just would point out that um, there's a, a really useful tool on CVP's website actually that allows you to check the, the coverage of various dis different lenses. So for instance, you can program in um, for a particular uh, camera and a particular camera sensor readout mode. You can program in your lens and it will give you a projection image of the coverage of that lens, which is quite handy. So if you put the um, FX9 in 6K and put a, a Zeiss CP3 on it, then everything is covered and, and all is good in the world. If you were to then change that to a, a Zeiss uh, lightweight zoom or something like that, then you can see that the lightweight zoom is designed for super 35 mil and doesn't cover the entire uh, image sensor there. So it's, a, it's quite a useful tool for checking before you hire, rent, buy or borrow um, a, a particular lens, whether it's going to cover the image sensor mode of, of your particular camera. Um, I just want to mention there, there is a, a kit lens that comes with the, the FX9. If you, if you buy the, the K for kit version, it costs you about two and a half grand extra, but it comes with uh, a lens. And any of you have a, an FS7 Mark I? Anybody bought the FS7 Mark I? Have you still got the lens for it? I would imagine it's gone up in value because it's the most peculiar lens that it came out with the FS7 Mark I, which was a super 35mm camera. But this lens is a full frame lens and covers a much larger area than the, the FS7 sensor, which meant therefore that it was cropping the image basically and it wasn't going as wide as you thought it was going to be. So you will have put that 28mm lens on the front of your camera expecting a certain wide angle performance and been slightly disappointed, I imagine. Strangely, that lens has kind of come back into its own because the exact same lens is now shipping with the FX9 as a standard kit lens. And because it's a full frame lens, it matches the camera perfectly. And a 28mm in full frame will do exactly what you expect a 28mm to do. It's a bit of a quirky lens. If you, if you crash the zoom in manually, then it, it's not manual at all, really. It's fly by wire. And it sort of says, oh, we're going zooming, are we? And it's kind of sort of gets its act into gear and zooms off at a nice steady rate and catches up eventually. So it's a bit quirky, but it's, it's a... Hello? Oh, there we are, we're back. It's a surprisingly good lens. Um, and, and it's worth a look if you've got time to have a, a quick play around with the, the, the one on the camera back there. And that's the uh, 28 to 135 lens. There are those cynical people amongst us who, who think that Sony had a big pile of them left in the factory. And that's the only reason they started making the FX9, to get them used up. But that, that's, that's just way too cynical. So that's the um, FX9 kit lens. And uh, Sony are also introducing some uh, new E-mount uh, lenses uh, derived from their G Master stills lenses reassuringly expensive if I can borrow another um, company's marketing phrase uh, they're, they're a little bit chunky on the price but um, rather rather smart lenses 16 to 35 is going to be the first one off the block which will be a t3.1 lens uh, and with a with a removable servo kit attached to the lens but to be honest there's any number of, of uh, 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 lenses available uh, that will fit on an E-mount camera. The great strength of the E-mount lens system is that short back focal length. Uh, the, the, the flange back distance is about 19 millimeters on the on E-mount, the e which leaves you plenty of room for making, adap making adapters 
that will fit any, any, uh, pretty much anything else. So EF to E mount still works perfectly well. So if you've got um, a Metabones adapter that you used on your um, FS7 camera, you can still use that with your E mount lenses on the FX9 camera. If it's a speed booster flavor, um, then uh, that would be um, that would be a little bit of an oddity. You'd probably want a straight through variety that doesn't squish the image into the Super 35 mil mode. If you have got the speed booster, you can continue using it, no problem. Um, uh, you just need to switch the camera into Super 35 mode and it, it behaves exactly like a, an FS7 did. So, um, I've got some lens tables there. One thing I, I just wanted to point out that when you embiggen your image sensor and put more pixels on there, it takes longer to read them out. It's more difficult, there's more processing power required. And that knocks on in a pretty straightforward way into the, the, the frame rates that you can squeeze out of your camera. So the bigger the number of pixels on the front end, uh, the slower you, you're gonna be reading them out. So if we look at the, the Venice, for instance, um, people ask me what frame rates can you shoot out on the Venice? And uh, I just have to throw my hands up and say, oh, sorry, I'm gonna have to get the, get the crib sheet out. It's so bloody complicated because the, the, the various frame readout modes and license key options make it pretty complex in order to work out. It's actually a bit easier to work out with the FX9. And this is the chart for the FX9. And if you're, uh, in the highest scan modes, up here, um, uh, sorry, uh, at this end of the, uh, sorry, in the full frame range, then y your, your maximum frame rate is going to be 25 to 30 frames a second. So if you're in the, using the full 6K full frame sensor area, the maximum readout speed will be 25 or 30 frames a second. Um, I don't know if you noticed on the uh, the the I'll, sorry, I'll just have to skip back a bit here. But on the um, diagrams for the FX9 here, there was this strange one here called 5K readout mode here. And that's a, a, a readout mode that is due to be released in a future software introduction. And the whole reason for that really is Sony asked themselves, what frame rates can we still achieve 50 frames a second at, what resolution is the maximum that we can go to and still achieve 50 frames a second? Or 60 if you're in the States or Japan or something. And the answer was 5K. So at 4K, you can achieve 50 or 60 frames a second, no problem. At 6K, you can go up to 25 or 30. So how, how big can you go and still manage to read out at 50 frames a second? And the answer was 5K which is why this rather peculiar scanning mode will appear at a later date on the FX9. That's the only reason it's there. It's, it's so that you can, you can do 50p um, um, at uh, the maximum possible uh, resolution and frame size. Actually, uh, somebody pointed out a good trick actually with the, uh, if you've got one of those speed boosters with, um, uh, with your FS7 or something, you could put it onto this camera shoot in super 35 mil mode and then you can still go up to 50 frames a second so if you've got to if you've got to shoot 6k or full frame at 60 frames a second that's actually uh, quite a neat way of doing it just just knock it down to 4k in uh, super 35 and use the speed booster so frame rates all get a little bit complicated but um, if I can point out at the moment in full frame, uh, as I say, you can go up to 25 frames a second. If you knock it down to 1920 by 1080, um, you can go up to 120 frames a second. And, and at some point in the future, you'll be able to go up to 180 or 150 frames a second. So um, as is usual with Sony cameras, there, there will be a roadmap. Nobody's actually seen the road map yet. So I might go veering off into the ditch at regular intervals because I don't know where the map's going. But um, judging from previous experience with cameras like the F5 and FS7, they're pretty good at telling you, you have this feature on this date and this feature on this date and then actually delivering it. Uh, but at the moment, as I say, there's no uh, definite plan 
been published yet. There will be a definite plan, but it's just not been published. So just scooting over to the, 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 one of the most important factors with full frame, depth of field. Um, and the general received wisdom is that if you have a bigger sensor, you have a shallower depth of field. Well, that, that kind of is and isn't true, really. Um, the things that affect depth of field are the focal length of the lens, the distance to the subject, and the aperture size. And the actual image sensor size isn't on that list. Um, the reason for that is, well, actually, I'll come back to that in a second. If you imagine a full frame sensor that's the background's nice to out of focus, the foreground's in focus, and you chop a small chunk out of it by switching it to Super 35 mode or, or into uh, Micro Four Thirds mode or whatever, you, you crop your large image sensor. If you crop your large image sensor, you're effectively changing the size of your image sensor. But if you think about it, that's not going to change the depth of field of that image that's projected onto that sensor. It can't possibly. The image is projected there and it's not the depth of field, it, bits of it aren't going to change and come in or out of focus as you crop that sensor. It couldn't possibly happen. So what happens is that you crop the sensor and you just get sharp foreground and the background is still out of focus. But of course the angle of view has changed. And what you need to do is to regain the original angle of view. So really you should say that it's not the changing of the image sensor size that, that changes the depth of field. It's the fact that in order to retain the same angle of view, when you crop the sensor, you have to change the focal length of the camera. So you have to shorten the focal length in order to widen the image out to get back to the original image size. And that is what changes your depth of field. Um, and uh, you could then, I suppose, you could actually open your iris by two stops and you again then regain the original depth of field. So um, in order to go from, say, micro four thirds to super 35, uh, sorry, to full frame, you could just open the iris two stops and you, you're back where you want to be. The trouble is opening the iris two stops is, is not usually a practical thing. You're always on that end stop anyway. So that's just not going to happen. So um, theoretically, though, you, you could uh, have a shallower depth of field as you wanted by just keep opening and opening that iris. Um, I just finally, um, I, I just created a bit of an image um, in my back garden the other day. I must have been feeling a bit bored. Um, and here we have um, the camera in full frame 6K mode. And the next frame is I've sw s selected it into su Super 35 mode and widened the iris out. Sorry, widen the uh, focal length out. And you, you can, this is the difference, basically, that we're looking at. It's not a perfect setup because it was done on the, uh, the kit lens that's with the camera, which is only an F4 lens. And, and really, to, to explore the depth of field issue properly, you'd, you'd want a slightly faster lens, really. But even with an F4 lens, you can see that full frame 6K and Super 35. And that's the difference you're getting. Not a perfect illustration, I would have to say, but it's, it's not a massive difference that you're getting. It's a small difference, uh, but it does make a difference to your picture quality. There are plenty of other things that go with the, the change of sensor to full frame. So in the FX9, because it's a new sensor, there's all sorts of new technology that goes with it. So there's the autofocus, which is rather splendid and uh, is set up on, on the camera behind you if you'd like to come and have a look at it. There's the extra dynamic range, another, another stop to take it up to 15 stops of dynamic range. Um, there's the dual ISO mode that I mentioned before, giving you the sensitivity. And perhaps most importantly, some tweaks to the, the color science that have actually been stolen from the Venice camera. Um, but all these new technologies added together uh, are, are in this new full-frame sensor. There's a couple more images here if you want to look at the difference between them. And you can see a tiny difference in the resolution as well, because one is sampled at 6K off the image sensor, and one is sampled at 4K off the image sensor. They're both sampled at, uh, recorded at 4K, but 
then because of the Bayer pattern technology that's used in the image sensor, um, you, you're never really getting uh, a 6K image out of a 6K uh, sampling sensor anyway. It's somewhat, somewhat less than that. So uh, actually, because of the Bayer pattern, the way it works, although you're sampling 6K photo sites, the actual RGB resolution of the sensor is somewhere around 4K, which suits very well uh, the 4K recording on the camera. I'll keep it fairly short, folks, because um, it's bloody freezing up here. And uh, I'm sure you're all frozen as well. So if anybody's got any questions, we'll leave it there for now. Thank you very much. Thank you.